In the last lesson, we talked about an ability to take text characters and encode them into patterns of ones and zeros. But our description of ASCII fell a little bit short. If you recall, ASCII stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. American sort of limits us. You know, when you're restricted to the Latin alphabet, suddenly you have, have cut off a number of, of languages, including, for example, we talked about German with the S and uh, Spanish with the Ñ, and there were, at the time, no uh, ability to put, you know, accents or umlauts or anything like that on your characters. For a time, they experimented or actually used something called extended ASCII. Now remember, ASCII was seven bits. So it always started with a zero, and then you had the seven bits to represent 128 different things. Patterns, the patterns of ones and zeros represented letters, numbers, punctuation marks, some control characters, and so forth. Extended ASCII just simply said, hey, let's use that eighth bit. Use it for a one put a one in that position, and suddenly we've got 128 new patterns that we can, can handle. Still, 256 doesn't quite handle much. For example, what about any of the Asian languages? Or what about uh, hieroglyphics, for example? Well, in the end, what happened was there was a thing called Unicode Code Points. Now, please understand, Unicode in itself is not considered an encoding. It's just simply an assignment, a mapping of a character to a, a binary pattern of ones and zeros. Now, the pattern of ones and zeros, as of this recording, goes from zero all the way up to a hexadecimal 10FFFF. That's actually a lot of patterns of ones and zeros. It's over a million of them. I think, in fact, that gives us 1,114,112 different points, different numbers to assign to characters. So that should be pretty good. In fact, we have the ability to uh, still use ASCII. And in fact, one of the things that the Unicode code points do for us is take those first 128 different patterns of ones and zeros and map directly from ASCII to the Unicode code points. And there's actually a really important reason for this. We'll talk about this in a minute when we start talking about UTF-8. But all the code points after that, and in fact extended ASCII, the ones that, that, that one byte that started with the one, we just you know, hit, we hit rewind, threw those away, started over in order to assign the different patterns after that. But the Unicode code, code points give us things like Latin alphabet characters, like the letter A. Um, they give us characters from other languages, such as the essay that we were talking about and the Enye that we were talking about. Uh, heck, we can do Egyptian hieroglyphs if we want. Hey, we can even do emojis. <coughs> so, that said, whenever you see a Unicode code point written out, you usually see it in the format of a capital U, a plus, and then you'll have typically four, but if you need more digits, you can have more digits, the hex value of that code point. So for example, let's talk about capital A. Capital A is a 41 hex, so you'd see U plus 0041 hexadecimal, and that goes or translates to or maps to a capital A, all right? So, this gives us a great deal of flexibility. I mean, if you go to, uh, I think it's unicode.org, and look at what they call a code chart, the code charts show all of these mappings that are available, and there are plenty of them, plenty of them. They include the emojis, they include, uh, you know, uh, any of the scripts, heck, ancient Cyrillian, uh, and, and all sorts of scripts that you can find in these code points. Now, that does not, though, 
cover the encoding. How do these patterns of ones and zeros get stored or transferred from one, de one device to another device? In fact, you probably saw, if you've done any sort of HTML coding, that you can define the encoding scheme. Um, UTF-8 is by default probably the most common one, and there's a good reason for that. Let's talk a little bit about UTF-8. And there's UTF-16 and UTF-32 and so forth. UTF-8 is actually a variable length for each one of these code points. You can represent any of those code points using UTF-8, but it's flexible. So UTF-8 gives us the ability to transmit one of these code points in a single byte, in two bytes, in three bytes, or four bytes. And it does this by using the preceding or the starting of the most significant patterns of ones and zeros to identify whether we are receiving one byte, two bytes, three bytes, or four bytes. Let's start off down here with just one byte. So one byte UTF-8. All right, the way this starts out is we have just a single byte All right, there's our one byte. Now, how do we identify this? Well, we're looking in memory and we see a byte. Is it one byte, two byte, three byte, four byte? Which, which UTF-8 is it? We need to have an identifier. Well, all UTF-8 one bytes start with a zero. And by starting with a zero, we recognize that this is just going to be a single byte. And in fact, there's a really important reason for this. We got seven bits left. Does that seven bits kind of sound familiar? Well, yeah, it sounds like ASCII, right? So if we've got a one byte UTF-8 character, we actually recognize this as just being a direct mapping to the ASCII encoding. All right, so if you have anything, and, and we've thrown out, we've thrown out extended ASCII, we're not gonna use extended ASCII. If there starts with, if it starts with a zero, we know that the following seven bits are the seven bits of ASCII. And there's a really important reason for doing this. The primary reason is this thing called backwards compatibility. Backwards compatibility says that if we stored something as ASCII, can it be read as UTF-8? Turns out it can, because ASCII is really just the same as single byte UTF-8. And in fact, let's go ahead and convert this Unicode value here for capital A, that 41 goes into these seven, uh, seven bits. So starting with, we'll just start with the least significant nibble here. We'll do 0, 0, 0, 1. That takes care of that nibble. And then the 4, that's 1, 0, 0. It's just the three bits are required to represent a 4. So 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. If you read that in binary and you know that this is UTF-8, the 0 says, hey, it's just one byte, just straight ASCII. The rest of the bits are going to be 7-bit ASCII. That's a capital A. Now, let's talk about the range. The range for seven bit, uh, for the 7-bit UTF-8 goes from all zeros, so it goes from 0 up to, well, what's the upper limit? Well, the upper limit is how big a number can we represent with 7 bits? Well, 2 to the 7 minus 1, or 127. So we have 127, or 128 with the 0, patterns of 1s and zeros that we can represent with UTF-8 one byte. All right, let's go to the next level. How about 2 byte UTF-8? Well, it has to start with a 1. The reason it has to start with a 1 is to distinguish it from 1 byte UTF-8. All right, so this guy is going to start with a 1, right? Unfortunately, the next bit, or fortunately, because this is part of the encoding scheme, the next byte bit also has to be a 1. So this first byte of a 2 byte UTF-8 is going to start with 1, 1, and then a 0. 110. One, so if you open up memory 
and you see something that you know is encoded as UTF-8, and you see a byte that starts with 110, you know that this is the first byte of a two-byte sequence. Now, for a two-byte, three-byte, four-byte sequence, the remaining bytes, the ones that, that are coming after the locomotive, so to speak, those are all going to start with one zero. So here's our next byte. And this is going to start with a one zero. So once again, you open up memory, you see a byte. If it starts with one zero, you go, uh, this is not the first byte. It can't be the first byte because there must be another byte before it that identifies the number of bytes we're expecting to receive. So in this case, if I see a one zero, I know that I have something that came before it that told me how many bytes to expect. All right. Now, the rest of these bits, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, those 11 bits will contain our Unicode code point. And so we will see mapped, similar to how we mapped in this A into the, four, into the one byte UTF-8, we're going to take anything that requires, and this is based on the number of, of significant bits in this UTF-8 code point, if it can be contained anywhere from eight bits, because seven bits and below can be contained in one byte, if it's eight bits up to 11 bits of, of significant bits, we know that UTF-8 two byte needs to be required or is required. So how many patterns does that give us? Well, this range is now 128 up to, well, what's the largest value we can represent with 11 bits? Turns out it's 2047, all right? So if you've got a Unicode code point here, and this value here is from 128 up to 2047, you know we need two bytes. All right, how about three bytes? All right, three bytes. Well, three bytes, and I am definitely going to run out of board space here. Three bytes starts with a one, 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 zero. It starts with three ones and then a zero. And then everything after that starts with a one, zero, and then leaves the bits, right? And then we'll get another one coming after that. Give our space one zero. So notice that every trailing bit, all the ones that come after the locomotive, so to speak, all begin with one zero. Now, how many bits does this give us for three byte UTF-8? Well, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 bits. 16 bits. That means that anything above 2047, so we're looking at 2048 up to, well, how many, what's the largest value we can represent with 16 bits? Turns out that it is 2 to the 16th minus 1, or 65,535. So if you see a Unicode code point that in decimal is from is between 2048 and 65,535, then we're going to require three byte. All right. Four byte. Four byte UTF-8. Any guesses as to what it's going to start out with? Bet you can. Four byte UTF-8 starts with one, two, three, four ones, and then a zero. Then after that, we have one, two, three bytes that all begin with one zero. They all begin with one zero, right? Now, how many bits? What's the bit range for this particular guy? Well, the bit range for this guy is I've got one, two, three bits here plus six bits here, that's nine, plus another six bits, that's 15, plus another six bits, that's 21. So any of the Unicode code points that requires more than 16 bits up to 21 bits, they go in four byte. 
And you know, this also allows us to keep expanding, right? We could have a five byte if we needed it. One, 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 zero, and then all the trailing bytes. So it's variable, and I should be able to tell right up front how many bytes are going to be in this particular encoded character encoded in UTF-8. So let's do a quick example. We've already done the capital A. Let's do pi. Pi is in Unicode. It is Unicode. I've got this down here. 03C0. All right. Now we convert 3C0 to binary. So 3C0, uh, or well, we could convert the whole thing, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, and then 0, 0, 0, 0. All right. So there is our full binary conversion of the four bytes of that UTF, uh, of that, excuse me, of that Unicode value into binary. Now, the question is, is how many, how many bits are we going to need? Which one of these guys are we going to use? Well, what you do is you start on the right-hand side and you count down the number of bits until you get to the most significant one that appears in the number. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10. 10 bits will fit in 2-byte UTF-8, because I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 positions. Now, starting on the least significant side, what I do is I just simply map these down. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So the least significant six bits are all zeros. So they just map to that second byte of the two byte UTF-8. So that got us up to this point. Now here, I take the next five bits coming from the right hand side. So we've got one, 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 zero. One, 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 zero. All right. And so if we were to encode pi, this Unicode code point for pi in 2 byte UTF-8, it would look like 110, that indicates 11 says that it's, excuse me, 110 says that it's 2 bytes, and then 01111 would be the first 5 byte bits of the, of, the, uh, of the Unicode code point, and then the next bit, byte, would be 10 followed by all zeros to show the last 6 bits of that code point. And so in UTF-8, what we have for pi in UTF-8 is, that's C, this is F, this is 8, and this is 0. So in UTF-8, we would store this as CF-8-0. All right. In the next episode, we're going to take a look at some patterns of ones and zeros that have been encoded into Unicode transformation format and see what they represent in the real world or in which code point they represent so that we can translate them to what you should be seeing on the screen.